I'd like to take your questions in uh, groups of three. Um, so I believe that uh, there are some free microphones in the back. Uh, so if you could please uh, give your affiliation and identify yourself when you ask a question. Uh, we'll take three at a time, please. Yes, Nick. And Javier as well. Okay, thank you. Nick Coleman from Argus. Um, one maybe more technical question and maybe a political one as well. Um, could you just elaborate on your point about incentivizing investors uh, to invest in domestic gas production? Um, that's something that started to happen quite recently in Nigeria, for example. And how, how do you see that kind of actually, what are the incentives? Um, and then uh, maybe a political question. Uh, does the, your scenario presuppose any particular foreign policy on the part of the United States? Is anything, in terms of Middle East policy, uh, is anything required of the United States there? Um, is uh, also the Iranian nuclear issue, is that at all relevant in, to this? Uh, That's, thank you. Okay, thanks, Nick. That's two questions, and maybe we can do uh, one more from ha from Javier. Javier Lars from the Financial Times. Uh, I have also two questions, but they are brief. Uh, one is, uh, if you got any feedback from the authorities in Baghdad, particularly the Ministry of Oil, and the advisors to Prime Minister on, on your main scenario that, in effect, is half what the Iraqi government has signed with international oil companies, if you got any feedback, what, what it was. And, and the other one, could you just give us a bit of clarity and you know, a, a bit of color where the oil, I mean, just looking at, at the table, and maybe one, and just looking at this now, but you are forecasting an increase of 1.2 million barrels a day from a, about today to the end of 2015. So in three years, you are putting a hell of an expansion in, in Iraqi oil production where um, you cannot still go outside in many areas of the country with our flat jacket. Uh, international oil companies struggle to send staff. There is problems with ammunition that is still exploding in the areas. And how that's going to be possible in so that short term period just to increase production so quickly? Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Let's just do those two since there's four questions total. <laughs> yeah, perhaps I can. Uh give the uh, technical uh, answers to technical questions. First of all, uh, the incentives for uh, uh, gas. There are two things uh, uh, here I should mention. Uh, the, there were some uh, bits uh, in Iraq for uh, gas production and we didn't see a lot of interest from the uh, companies uh, to uh, to uh, actively be a part of the production there. Uh, there may be a need to give a second look of the uh, framework conditions of uh, those bids and the uh, investment uh, conditions, uh, including the fact that the, if they are not only thought of for exports, the, uh, for the uh, domestic use, what will be the price of uh, domestic gas prices, uh, whether or not they are lucrative enough for the investors is uh, two type of incentives uh, we are uh, uh, meaning there. Uh, the, uh, I will leave the question to the uh, U.S. Uh, policy uh, to our executive director, if you agree, uh, uh, Maria, uh, which is, the, is, is this one, I guess. Uh, the um, feedback, yes, uh, we in fact, as our executive director mentioned, uh, we worked very closely with the Iraqi uh, government. Uh, we had uh, two people seconded from uh, one from the uh, Somo, uh, one from the uh, uh, Basra uh, uh, from the south. And uh, our work is peer reviewed by the uh, Deputy Prime Minister's office as well as other uh, officials of uh, uh, Iraqi government and at the same time the Kurdish region government. We have different views about the, uh, um, uh, we agree that we have different views and uh, our high scenario is in line with the, uh, 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 with the uh, plans, but we are uh, much more uh, careful, especially looking at the challenges lying ahead. 
A final point uh, to uh, uh, Javier, in the next three years, 1.2 million barrels per day. Can they uh, make this increase? I think they can. It means uh, 400 uh, each year. And when you look at the last two years, they increase about 800,000. It means they have to do uh, in the next three years what they did in the last uh, 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 two years. And uh, of course, these are not uh, granted. If there are uh, major uh, problems, challenges in front of them, we uh, may see a delayed case becoming the reality. But looking at their past record of two years, and the, uh, some encouraging signs in the recent uh, weeks coming from uh, uh, discussions between uh, Baghdad and Erbil uh, make me believe that uh, this uh, is within reach uh, for uh, Iraq. Thanks. Uh, uh, yes. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Next question. Well, I would like to, to add something to your last comments and then I'll come back to your, to your questions. Yes, three scenarios, that's true. And uh, one is a bit more conservative, that's ours. But let's be, let's, be, let's be clear about one thing. The resources are there. And everybody knows that the resources are there. But the question is, how much time will it take Iraq to explore them? And then we look into a number of conditions that have to be met. Conditions that have to, to do with, for instance, just to name a few, Human capacity. You need a lot of people to do that. And the education in Iraq has been lagging behind. You need technical people. You need a lot of skills also in planning, in seeing that you have the right investments, in logistics, etc. You need to have a strong legal and regulatory framework. That is what foreign investors need. You need to have an efficient and transparent management of revenues and spending. And you need to have a broad, a very broad political consensus on the direction of future policy and future strategy. These things have to be developed, and Iraq is developing them. So it's not a question about the resources, but it's a question, a matter of speed, and how fast the conditions can be met. Then coming back to the, to the foreign policy issue, what, we, what you can see in the, um, in the, res, in, in the review is that between now and 2020, non-OPEC supply to the market will be higher. But after 2020, it will be not the non-OPEC supply, but the OPEC supply that will have to grow faster. And that's where Iraq comes in. And we think it's of the utmost importance that the resources of Iraq can be used, not only for our benefits and for the world's benefits, but as mentioned before by Fatih Birol, for the benefit of the countries as well, to diversify the economy and to see to it that their economy is really recovered. Then, about Iran. Yes, of course, it's relevant what's happening there. We all know what is happening there. But it's for the short term. And what we are here discussing now is also for the midterm and for the longer term. And I think it's very important that the, um, the political situation in Iraq itself is going to be strengthened and that the internal issues that are still there are going to be solved. And that's the most important thing for Iraq. Thank you, Mrs. Van der Hoeven. Uh, yes. Mina Harbelu from Al Jazeera TV. Um, you have mentioned uh, like a, uh, numbers of conditions for Iraq to overtake Russia or uh, Saudi Arabia in 2035. Um, uh, have you taken into consideration uh, uh, the, the situation on the ground and the security issues and the lack of investments and serious investors in Iraq? And as well, have you taken into consideration the lack of agreement between the, uh, all the parties in the government to reach what they have to reach in 2035? Thank you. Thank you. Did we have one in the back? Sorry. I thought I saw a hand go up there. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Lee Elston from Interfax Energy. Um, you mentioned that the biggest p potential for non-associated gas production is the, in the Kurdistan region. Um, do you see them boosting production and exporting gas to Europe or to Turkey independently from Baghdad? There's already lots of discussion of them building pipelines and export plans um, without the... Um, the uh, advocacy from Baghdad, or do you see exports being delivered jointly with, um, with the uh, federal government? Thanks. 
to you in just a second. You had one more. We'll get to you in the next one. Jill Janola from Energy Intelligence. I'm just wondering with the, with the various growth scenarios for Iraq, how does a, a future OPEC quota, how is that factored in and, and what are the sort of assumptions about what sort of quota Iraq may face? Thanks, Dad. Okay. Thank you. Would you like to start? Okay. Yes, we'd like to make, start with the answers to the first two questions and I'm sure that uh, Fatih Birol will elaborate on it. Well, of course, all all of our projections are contingent of Iraq consolidating and extending the gains achieved in recent years in, in terms of security and political, and political stability. And it's true, the security situation has been and will continue to be crucial, crucial to the development of both Iraq's energy sector and the economy in overall. And the security risks are by no means uniform across Iraq. And the number of incidents in the key oil-producing oil province of Basra and, and, and even more so in the, in the Kurdistan area being lower, being lower than in and around the capital. That's the first remark I would like to make. And to, your, to the other question about the independent gas from Kurdistan flowing to Europe, just put it all together. Yes, Iraq, Iraq can be a very, very cost-competitive supplier to a number of markets, including the neighboring ones and including Europe. And our projections in the central scenario see also to that gas exports, exports starting around 20, 2020. And of course, clarity over the legal conditions for export will bring forward and expand the exports for gas export from this region of Iraq to others. And and continued uncertainty will push them back. So that brings me back to one of the conditions I, uh, I mentioned in my first uh, round of answers. Clarify internally all the uh, decision-making conditions, all the decision-making decision -making, uh, uh, mechanism and the authorities in Iraq itself. That's crucial. That's crucial. Uh, about the third question, um, I mean, this is OPEC, what would OPEC do? And we, as I hear, don't uh, make comments on the OPEC's uh, business. It is up to them to decide uh, what they are going to do. But the increasing uh, uh, production uh, coming from uh, Iraq in the next years to come uh, uh, will be effect for all producers in OPEC or outside OPEC. And uh, I, if the Iraqi government says years and years they have not produced oil and didn't enjoy the uh, uh, export revenues and they are now uh, in the middle of reconstructing their country and they uh, badly need those revenues i think uh, this is a, a, a well justified uh, argument for it is uh, for their discussion with uh, fellow oil producers thanks david you had a question yes. Uh, yeah, David Strawn reporting for Newsbase. Um, Fati, you've said for a long time that uh, Iraq is vital to the global oil supply, um, and you're saying it again today. I just wonder how vital. What happens if, in the low case, in the deferred case, what happens to global oil production? Is, it, is Iraq's contribution the difference between global oil production peaking and not peaking? Um, and, and if so, what date would that happen in the low deferred case? And if you could pass it to the person right behind you. Thank, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Vandana from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and uh, my focus was a little bit on renewables. If you could elaborate on the electricity market um, that you talked about, you talked about a 50% generation shortfall, and you said by 2015 it could be covered. I just wanted to know if you looked at specifically renewables. There's a small slice in the um, slide that is there, um, and I just wanted to know if you could tell us a little bit about wind and solar and all of that. Thank you. So, uh, I will oh, take we'll two, two, one, one more. Hi, um, Will Scargill from uh, Global Data. I was wondering what account, uh, you said that because the Iran is a short-term problem uh, or a short-term issue at the moment and the analysis is mi mid to long-term, um, what account is taken of the possibility of um, the 
constraints on Iran's exports being lifted in the future? Okay. Shall I make a comment on the last question and then we go back to, to the rest? Well, the constraints uh, on Iran's ex uh, export, well, we all know that it has to do with the answer of Iran to the um, um, sanctions, and the sanctions are there not for nothing. That's a real political question. So you can understand that I'm not going, that I can't answer it. But of course, we are there. I monitor the situation, not only day by day, but hour and hour, because we want to know what's happening there and what the impact might be. Well, uh, later this week, we'll, um, we'll uh, launch our next uh, oil market report and our midterm report, market report on oil. And some of the answers will be there, but of course, it's no forecast. It's no forecast. And it's very difficult to answer your question in a, in a forecasting sense of answer. I can't do that. But of course, as we, met, as we mentioned before, we, uh, we are there, we monitor the market, and if necessary, we are there to act. <coughs> and the renewables? Yes, and then, and then you do the rest? Yes, about the renewables. Well, you know, of course, as well as I do, that the, uh, the potential is there. The potential is there, especially in hydro and, and, and in solar. And uh, we have hydro growing in, uh, in our scenarios considerably, but given the, the high cost of, of, of solar PV compared to other peaking technologies and the weak government commitment to expand its use, we, we don't include a major increase in our projections. But, but there may well be a number of, of grid applications for renewables in more rural areas, and we think that future policy expectations may evolve, particularly as the GDP expands in Iraq and after, of course, full electricity supply is restored in the country. So the potential is there. Hydro is already in our, in our projections, solar less, but we can see it in um, off-grid applications for renewables in rural cases at this moment. Okay, the f last question was, uh, if it was the first question from, from, from David, what happens to global uh, oil production uh, if uh, it is a delayed case, if Iraq uh, uh, does not increase its production uh, as much as uh, we would like to see and Iraqis would like to see? What happens, uh, uh, David, is that we will, uh, the global oil markets will be set uh, on a uh, course for troubled waters because there are not uh, many easy uh, geologies and low cost areas in the world which would help us to meet the growth in the uh, demand and at the same time uh, compensate the decline in the mature uh, uh, fields. So this would mean uh, tightness in the markets and uh, higher prices which we think is not a good news for the, uh, for the economy in any case. Uh, for the production peak, uh, you will uh, see it in the uh, 12th of November. We, uh, we give the, our work energy outlook. We come up with a fresh uh, oil outlook analysis there, including the analysis of the uh, uh, light tight oil and uh, other things and the changing energy landscape. So, so you have a, a peak forecast in your, in your next one, and the other? We have to wait a bit, a couple of more weeks, I guess. Thank you. Then you can come back. <laughs> he always does. <laughs> yes, <so. laughs> yes, there's one here and the woman in the black at the back. Uh, thank you. Grant Smith from Bloomberg. Uh, could I just double check a couple of um, numbers, uh, please? You mentioned, uh, Dr. Birol, that Iraq's exports to China could reach uh, 2 million barrels a day. And I just wanted to check the time frame for that. Uh, the other thing is the, the Kurdistan uh, output projection, which uh, I see comes to about 800,000 barrels a day by 2020. Is that included in the Iraq country total? Thanks. Julia Kastein for the Austrian newspaper Die Presse. I guess I have a political question as well. Um, I'm wondering um, how um, the increase in Iraq's um, oil production and its significance in the world will affect its political role. How do you see that? I mean, there were reports today that Iraq is supplying the Syrian government with oil despite the Western sanctions. So I'm wondering where you see Iraq headed there. And there's one in the front. 
Miss Sarah Kent, Dow Jones News was. Um, sort of a follow-on question from that. Um, you've already mentioned Iran, but I was wondering about the broader political instability in the region, in Syria, for instance, and what potential that might have to derail your projections for Iraq. Would you like to take that? Mm -hmm. Well, we all know what is happening at this moment in Syria, and uh, and we also know what is happening between Syria and Turkey, and we also know that it's it's it might be a possible threat to oil production in the north of Iraq and in the transport to the west. That's what we know for the moment. Of course, these kind of things, these recent developments, are not within are not within within within, within this outlook. That's uh, that that's impossible. That you can't have it. This is one of the. This is one of the events, of the unexpected events that can happen all the time. This is a negative one, but there can also be positive ones, of course. My second remark is that um, the uh, enormous amounts of uh, resources in oil and gas that are in Iraq and that are very easily accessible because of low cost and easy geology will certainly have an impact on the balance of power within the region. That's, that's for sure. And of course, that will also have an impact on, 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 on the world. So it will affect its political role because it, it has an effect of its, on its importance. How that will develop in future, that depends, of course, on whether the central scenario might come true. And that brings me back to, the, to your forecast and to your numbers. Yeah. In fact, the, uh, our numbers, the growing export uh, numbers, indicate that the China uh, will be the main a destination for uh, Iraq. There will be a new trade axis between two Bs, between Baghdad and Beijing. It is a new one and coming very strongly and not only in terms of the oil exports but also uh, China being one of the major uh, investors in uh, Iraq. So uh, they, uh, they exports the, uh, to China, Iraqi export to China, uh, around close to 1.5 million barrels per day in 2020 and 2 million barrels per day around 2035. The other question, uh, the, uh, the, all the numbers I gave today and the uh, Iraq, uh, the numbers that the, uh, our executive director gave you today and Iraq, they are covering the entire country. Mm -hmm. When we give a, a KRG number, it is just additional information. Mm -hmm. For example, if I say it is 8, 8 million barrels per day for Iraq, it includes also KRG, which, uh, which is about, mm -hmm. in our central scenario, 800 KBD, but in the high case, which is a, a for uh, KRG, there's a lot of upside potential, which is about 1.2 million barrels per day for the, uh, for the KRG. Okay, what is the number for KRG in 2020? Uh, 500 uh, in the central scenario and the 800 in the uh, high case. Thank you. I think we have time for one or two more questions, please. Let's get to someone who hasn't asked one and then uh, come back to you. Hi, uh, Finn O'Reilly from ISIS Heron. Uh, just a quick question. Have you any forecast for gas exports to Turkey and or Europe? Over by 2020 or 2035. And uh, have your, you get the last word. Thank you. And if I may, for the executive director, it's not a Iraqi related question, but it's more looking at the oil market. If we can have your assessment of how the oil market is looking at the moment, taking into account that we are heading into the winter, prices remain relatively high, about $110, and, and looking at the shape of the, of the curve, the structure, the time spreads are looking backward dated across everything, particularly for gasoline, uh, counter-seasonal backwardation, also very backward dated in, um, in the diesel and heating oil market, so meaning that, um, well, we, we have not had the reveal on, on the stocks that we were expecting. So how you will characterize the situation in the market, uh, and particularly, do you, do you see the market as well supply? Thank you. Well, let's start with the answer to your question. It's, it's, you know, I would like to mention something, Greg. It's very interesting to see how people like you know how to reframe the question. Because the question always comes down to the same thing. What do you think of the market? Is it about the supply of the market? And what do you think about the oil market and the prices? Well, as you know, as I mentioned before, we are not a forecasting agency. We, uh, we follow the developments of the markets. We can see that 
at the moment the market is sufficiently supplied. We can also see that as far as crude goes, we can also see there are some problems with the product market. We have seen in Europe since in the, in the past few months that refineries have been uh, speeding up. And I think uh, that means uh, only one thing, that because they can see the better margins in the products, they are producing more. We can also see that there is a problem with the products market in the United States. And that, of course, is not because of the crude problem, it's because of the refinery problem. But nevertheless, coming back to your, to your question and to my answer that I gave a few minutes ago, we, um, we are very much aware of what happens in the market. We, uh, we check it, uh, as I mentioned, day by day, hour by hour. And if it's necessary, we are ready to act. That's all. If I can answer the, uh, about the Gaza exports, uh, the, uh, our uh, analysis showed that Iraq uh, can uh, produce about 90 BCM. And of course, the uh, Iraq gas strategy will uh, decide how much of it is going to be exported. And uh, we thought the first priority should be given to domestic uh, use of gas for electricity generation and perhaps for the industry as a feedstock and then export it. And in that case, uh, the, uh, there is a, a potential of 20 BCM of exports. But two disclaimers here, one uh, uh, economic, the other one is on the, uh, 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 the uh, Iraqi uh, side, the strategic side. The economic one is, according to our uh, analysis, the exports from Iraq to, uh, to Turkey or uh, Southeast uh, Europe is uh, the most competitive, has the most competitive costs, delivered cost. For example, it is much cheaper when you compare with the Caspian uh, delivered cost. But how it is going to be priced, mm -hmm. this gas is a different issue, but in terms of delivered cost, it is cheaper to get uh, gas from uh, Iraq uh, than uh, some other options. The strategic issue, the level of gas uh, production and exports, like oil, will depend on the uh, consensus on the legal uh, framework. This is the most important one. And uh, one takeaway from our study is that it is in everybody's interest in Iraq. It is in everybody's immediate interest in Iraq to have a, as soon as possible consensus on the governance of uh, hydrocarbon sector and uh, revenue sharing. When I say everybody, this includes the uh, federal government, regional government and other players in the uh, uh, Iraqi oil and gas uh, industry. Thanks very much. Before we conclude the press conference, I just would like to remind you all of some things that have already been discussed, but I'll mention them anyways. In one month's time, we'll be back in London for the launch of the World Energy Outlook on the 12th of November. Uh, this, this report's very, very big brother. And I would also like to add that this Friday, the IEA will be launching the medium-term oil market report. Uh, that is at 10 a.m. Paris time. Uh, that's taking place via webcast. Uh, if you would like to take part and have not yet received an invitation, please see me afterward. Thanks very much. Goodbye.